Okay. Great. All set. Welcome, everybody. welcome everybody uh, to our soil and water meeting. I'll start um, with introductions. I'm Dale Stein, Chair. Dave. Dave Bass, voting member. Thank you. Marka. Eric Goodman. Go ahead, Eric. Okay. All right. Okay, Eric. We'll turn it over to you. Um, Stephanie. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we can go, go ahead, I Bethany, guess, uh, around the room introduce here, everybody and then I'll do a, a quick roll call of folks on the line. So um, well, I guess I'll start. I'm Bethany Bisdew, the Executive Director of the State Soil and Water Conservation Committee. Hello, Brian Steinmiller, Assistant Director, Division of Land and Water Resources at Ag Markets. I'm Harold Venus. I'm a professor of soil science at Cornell University. I'm Joseph Omsili, Extension Associate at Cornell University. I'm Tim Clark, uh, Engineer for the State Committee. Debbie Aller, Extension Associate at Cornell University. Uh, yep. Go ahead. Uh, Tim Sheldon, I'm an Excelsior Fellow um, in the uh, Executive Office. Melissa Gordon, Administrative Assistant. All right, that's everybody here in the office today. So just real quick, I'll go down my uh, my list here um, for uh, State Committee staff. I know we're going to be a little short today because at the same time we've got conservation skills workshop happening and a lot of our staff are out uh, involved in that. But um, Greg Albrecht, be on the line? I don't think so. PJ Emmerich. Hey, good morning. Sorry, Bethany. Uh, good morning, everybody. Morning, PJ. Ryan Cunningham. Jennifer Clifford, Ben Luskin. Good morning, Ben Luskin, Region 5 AEA and State Aid to Districts Program Manager. Good morning, Ron Bush, Brendan Jordan, Scott Thickbaum. Almost called out everybody. Oh. Victor Giacomo, Lauren Prozorski, Tyler Neck. Okay, uh, moving on to advisory members. We actually had one of our advisory members join us here in Albany. So you go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, good morning. My name is Jeff Keogh. I manage the Agricultural Districts Program. Welcome. Um, CCE. Cornell Cows. Oh, yeah, quite a contingent for Cornell Cows. This is Brian from Cornell Cows. Morning, Brian. Morning. Uh, CDEA. Good morning, Caitlin Stewart, CDEA President. Good morning, DEC. Department of Health. Department of State. SUNY ESF. And NRCS. Morning, this is Paula Bagley, the State Conservation Engineer for NRCS and Acting State Conservationist for Blake Glover. Good morning, Paula. Um, and uh, Julie, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, Julie Suarez, Cornell Cows. Thank you. Um, yeah, that concludes our introductions. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, next on our list is uh, cor any correspondence, Bethany? No, I'll do a minute. Review and approve minutes first. Any additions or questions? If not, could I have a motion to approve, please? So moved. A second? Second. Moved and seconded. Vote of voting. Eric? 
Aye. Dave. Aye. And I vote aye also, so approved. Now we will go on to correspondence. Um, so we do not have any official correspondence to share with the state committee today. Um, for folks in Albany, I did dig out a few district newsletters that we have received over the past couple months. If anyone's interested in, in perusing those and, and checking out the work that districts have been doing throughout the year. Um, but other than that, uh, no official correspondence. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda is Ag Non Point Source with Bethany and Tyler. So it'll be just me today. Okay. Bear with me here and I will share. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so Tyler is uh, attending Conservation Skills Workshop th today, so he is unable to be with us to, to share a program update. Um, but he was kind enough to prepare um, our dashboards, our monthly dashboards, um, so they could be presented today at the meeting. For our Ed Nonpoint Source program, we currently have 171 active contracts which total approximately $61.3 million. Those are contracts um, from round 21 up to round 28. And I believe since the last time we met, um, round 28 contracts for the Agnon Point Source Program were still in the process of being fully executed. Uh, I'm happy to report that all of those are now um, executed and districts can start vouchering for funds and begin implementation on the projects that were um, awarded through that round of funding. Are there any um, other questions uh, or are, are there any questions on the Ag Non Point Source program? I will also add, Dale, that I do not have any amendments to present to the group today. Um, so we can skip that part on the agenda. Um, I don't know. Are, am I coming through audio-wise? Yep, I hear you loud and clear. All right. Um, so I guess if there are any questions on that, my very brief program um, update, I will uh, move on to the round 30 proposed uh, timeline, if that's okay with everybody. Sounds good. That need to pause on the round 30 is unbelievable. Round 30. <laughs> Even if we could start from start start from the beginning and start numbering them again, but that's pretty. <laughs> I remember round one. Yeah, right. <laughs> hey, I came here in we round, are. I came in round nine. So. <laughs> I reviewed a lot of proposals in round one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So. Um, 
Hopefully what you're seeing on the screen is our round 30, the proposed timeline that um, I have drafted up um, in anticipation of getting ready to be, to start working on um, the RFP for our next round of funding. Um, so a little bit of uh, background, I guess, on, on what has led me to this proposed timeline, but since round 21, so this is going back uh, several years now, the Ag Now Point Source RFP has been released uh, in January, or we have at least tried to release it in January, and then um, have applications be due somewhere in the early spring, and try to make awards by early summer. Prior to round 21, uh, the timeline for the Ag Now Point Source program, um, the RFP was generally announced in the fall, early fall, and applications would be due prior to the end of the year, and, and subsequently, you know, the contracts would, or awards would be made at the beginning of the following year. So for round 30, I uh, have drafted a proposed timeline that would kind of get us back to that prior to round 21 um, timeline. So we, um, have sketched out uh, a possible RFP release in October of 2024. And uh, that would then make applications be due uh, sometime in mid-December, which I'm sorry, that date is incorrect. It should say December, 2024. Um, mm -hmm with an application due date of mid-December 2024. That would allow us time to uh, review the proposals internally for eligibility and completeness and conduct a pre-review meeting with our panel of uh, Ag Non Point Source um, scores sometime probably uh, early January. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we would anticipate um, potentially being able to make awards in April of 2025. Uh, this draft timeline, um, I also shared with the Conservation District Employees Association as well, at, who then also shared it with districts just for um, initial feedback and reaction because this is a bit of a, a change from what we have been trying to stick to over the past you know, almost 10 years. And it would also hold off the release of the RFP for, for several additional months. Um, so I wanted districts to be able to kind of react to that um, and also start to perhaps you know, prepare if that is the direction that the voting members want to go in uh, with this proposed timeline. So the proposed timeline that I just kind of uh, went over follows a similar timeline to what we now offer for the AIM base program, which is, you know, our release in the fall, and we try to have contracts in place um, by January. That program is a little bit different because there you don't have to score applications, but this would get the Ag Nonpoint Source program kind of more in line with that. Uh, we also, with this proposed timeline, as you'll see um, a little bit later on when we talk about the proposed CRF timeline, We'll spread out our programs a little bit to lessen the contract load um, and, and hopefully then result in uh, having contracts uh, in the hands of districts a little bit faster. When I shared this initial timeline with districts, um, there were some um, concerns re regarding the delay or in delaying until October. Um, some felt that that would just result in a loss of um, of funding for a year. Um, however, I, I feel like to address that concern, we kind of have the AEM 18 program that is, uh, or will be up and running next year. Um, CRF might be coming uh, earlier than a non-point source. So we're just trying to spread out the, the pots of funding that are available to districts. Another concern that we heard was um, that by offering this timeline of releasing in October and having applications due in the winter and potentially not an executed contract until the summertime, um, that might result in a loss of construction season for farms. Um, 
in thinking about how we could potentially address that if we wanted to go with this timeline. Uh, we could offer multiple contract terms to allow districts to, to choose if they didn't really want to lose a construction season. They might choose a different like a farther out contract term. Um, but you know that's at this point uh, the major feedback that I got from districts regarding um, the proposed round 30 timeline. Um, I, I feel you do have to offer something so they don't lose the construction season due to the we already have difficult time getting them built within our long term windows with um, engineering and everything else. So if you have the ability to offer a delayed thing, if they want it, that would probably be a good should proceed that way. And that was something that was done, um, you know, in, in prior rounds of the Agnon Point Source Program, we kind of got away from it, just I think for more sim simplicity, just to keep track of one contract term mm -hmm. for all of the contracts. But that's definitely something we could get back to. Yeah, we're running over long term on an awful lot of contracts as it is, but COVID changed everything. So um, I think we need to be flexible. Any other discussions, questions? Need a motion to approve it, Bethany? Uh, yes, please. All right, I get a motion. All right, gotta get a second, please. Second. Move down second, it'll go to voting. Dave. Aye. Erica. Aye. And I vote aye. Approved. Thank you very much. Darren's here. Darren's here now. Darren's here now. Hey, Dale, Dar Darren is, uh, is, oh. is with us now. All right, Darren. Aye. Go vote. <laughs> Thank you. Honestly, your picture is so small on my computer, all I can see is the windows on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, do you have anything else on Ag Nine Point Source? Um, so later in the agenda, we will get back to um, Ag Nine Point Source. I will be presenting the Rounds 29 ranked list to the voting members for approval. Good. But um, we'll hold off until then. All right. Next on our list is um, the CRF, Jennifer and Tyler. Doesn't look like are they, neither of them are in today, are they? I'm going to do my best uh, to act as the program manager for Jennifer and to also provide uh, um, the updates that Tyler would otherwise uh, provide here. So, um, I don't mind, maybe I'll just take a look at the screen. It's much bigger. All right. So, CRF. Program status. Um, we are chugging right along here. Uh, I think uh, really good news to report at this point is that uh, the contracts um, for round six have started to move forward at a pretty good clip. So as Bethany was talking about contract workload here at the agency, not just within our division, but within our, our um, support divisions, fiscal and, and, and council, we've had to kind of meter them out and do one program at a time. Well, CRF um, uh, really started to move for us midsummer, and we are starting to see active contracts. So that is a really good sign, um, as we are also right around the corner going to be looking at round seven um, proposals just next month. So we'll have another another round of, of proposals to, to review and to uh, to execute contracts for. Uh, so you know CRF is uh, like I said moving right along with active contract amount nearly twelve million dollars, um, completed contract amount uh, nearly three million, and um, just under two million with still pending contracts. But that uh, that number is declining steadily, which is a good good sign. Um, so you know just for context right so we are we have six rounds of funding here um and represented here rounds two through six so five rounds it's a um uh, a program not nearly as mature uh, as our agnon point program um but we are in a good place right now with uh, the level of projects that are being being executed and being completed out there so that's all good news um 
Also, no amendments to, to report today for CRF. And uh, unless there are any questions with the program update, I can run right into the uh, uh, timeline for round eight. And if I'm not able to answer any questions, we can always come back to uh, any of this uh, next month when Jennifer and Tyler are both back here with us. Briefly. Yeah. So again, just uh, just to remind folks for round seven, um, uh, actually, I do have a, a bit of a status here. So sorry, I was about to skip right over round seven and go right to round eight. I'm a little out of practice here. But uh, Jennifer did provide uh, uh, an update for round seven applications. So again, this was the really large round where we had a um, uh, significant increase in the EPF uh, from $4 million annually to over $16 million uh, for the CRF program. Um, this was tied to a major um, uh, state of the state announcement and uh, significantly tied back to the strategies identified in the agriculture and forestry chapters of the uh, Climate Act scoping plan. So in response to round seven, we had 83 applications received uh, that represented 199 farms. Just as a reminder, $15 million was made available for this round, but we had a request of 22.6 million, so oversubscribed. A um, couple of key uh, practices to point out here, uh, key for soil health, which we're gonna hear a lot more about later on in the meeting today. Um, 66,430 acres of cover crops were proposed under CRF alone. Now that is in addition to the cover crop acres that were proposed in the economic point source. Uh, to put that in also a little bit more perspective, the last round, round six, there was 24,000 acres proposed. Um, so quite, quite an increase. Uh, we're also seeing a lot more riparian buffers proposed. Um, key agroforestry practice, something that we have a lot of experience in um, thus far. Um, we have 37.35 acres of riparian buffers proposed. Uh, we also opened up our track one to be more comprehensive for methane management. We received one precision feed project uh, proposal uh, that will start to uh, deal with enteric fermentation. Uh, we also, through our soil health, um, track uh, emphasize nutrient management. You know, let's also uh, continue to make good strides in nutrient management. So there are 12 projects proposed there. Um, CRF is a little different from other other, other uh, uh, programs where we do emphasize the eligibility of uh, equipment uh, for the purposes of, of practices. So uh, there were uh, 20 projects that uh, proposed uh, for the purchasing of specialized equipment. Um, to facilitate practice adoption. And also, as we've seen before, um, um, you know, a, a lack of response to our cover and uh, manure storage cover and methane capture projects, we saw a major increase in that as well. Um, opening up track one to uh, more, um, um, more types of projects, alternative manure management projects, but within that, we also saw eight cover and flare projects proposed. So that's a pretty major increase over past years. Um, right now, I think we only have 11 or 12 that we've done you know, through the previous rounds, a lot less money available. So we're all trending in the right direction here in regards to uh, our CRF program. It's so really happy to report that. Um, currently, those proposals are with our evaluators, uh, scoring those projects uh, according to each track and we should have a uh, ranked list available to the state committee next month for your consideration, and then we'll be able to make awards. Thanks for the reminder on that. That's pretty good information to skip in. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, comments on round seven? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Brian, when did the Climate Connects grant money start to flow in CRF? I wow, that. that's a good segue. To wondering if it's eight or nine. Yeah, it's eight. Eight. Yeah. Thank you. I yeah. should remember. Thank you for that good segue, too. That's a good question. Uh, so Julie just asked about the uh, USDA Climate Smart Commodities New York State uh, Connects pro uh, program. And um, uh, that is a good uh, segue to our round eight timeline. That would be the first round of funding where we would be using 
those federal dollars to continue uh, to uh, amplify our efforts across the state. And in so doing, you know, looking at all the requirements um, for that program, um, there's a lot of a lot of work ahead of us, you know, to, to fully integrate uh, those federal funds into the CRF program, as well as develop some other pilots that uh, um, we are uh, committing to do as well. So. Round eight will have the federal dollars, and also, of course, there's the state's bond act too. So um, a lot of that uh, work is 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 still ongoing, and um, we have um, submitted uh, our program RFPs and, and selection criteria um, to the office that is handling and coordinating all the bond act um, uh, programming. So it's uh, very likely that in the next round of funding for both Ag Nonpoint and CRF, we could also see bond act funding supplement our work as well. Um, taking all that uh, aside, however, um, Jennifer is presenting here a timeline for, for round eight um, development and release. So uh, this uh, particular uh, timeline is uh, rather consistent to the round seven timeline, but uh, shortened up by about a few weeks. Fast forward to the last uh, uh, key date on this, on this sheet of paper here. Um, that by September of 24, we'd have a final ranked list of projects and ready for release during Climate Week. It is Climate Week. Happy Climate Week, everybody. It's Climate Week 2023. Um, we don't have our CRF program ready. We will likely have our Ag Nonpoint program ready, though, for release um, in, in, this, in this week, where we uh, really focus uh, a lot of um, discussion and, and, and action around, around climate change. So, Really, the goal is for this time next year to have around eight projects ready to go. So back up from there. Um, that means that we would be releasing the round eight RFP in the months of February and March of 2024. Of course, as I already mentioned, um, you know, we are working very diligently to incorporate the federal funding and also to incorporate the additional um, forestry uh, focused funding that was set aside for us in the budget this past year. So. Um, we have um, standing internal meetings every week to um, discuss and start to incorporate those elements into the uh, uh, program guidelines and, and eventually the request for proposals. We've also started to gather feedback and um, uh, expertise from the field uh, to help us do that. And of course, we continue to meet with the uh, co-PIs uh, um, for the USDA uh, Climate Smart Commodities in New York State Connects, uh, so that we have a good handle on um, not just how we're going to implement the funds, but how we're going to measure the impacts of those funds and how we're going to translate that into um, um, you know, marketing of those climate smart uh, commodities and products. So those discussions are also ongoing, um, but we feel we can get the RFP out uh, early in 2024. Um, that means that we, of course, would be holding RFP training webinars, uh, you know, with our partners and discussing any of the significant changes, and also, uh, you know, addressing any pertinent uh, questions and answers during that time. Um, you know, we'll do uh, a, a eligibility review once the proposals are submitted, um, and we're looking at a, a, a timeline of June 2024. And again, that's going to allow us to uh, present the, the rank list to the state committee in September. So the month of August, similar to what we did this past this year, uh, we'll be reviewing and ranking those projects. So that is the proposed timeline um, or subject to change. Uh, but as you know, those changes may become necessary. We'll bring back uh, updates to the committee. Brian, are you going to need a mo motion on that today? Yes, please. Just like the icon point. That's Give us thought. your direction okay. and we'll uh, continue on. <clears throat> then um, I'm going to have to recuse because my brother wants to apply on round eight. So um, I'm going to step off. Just send me a text when you're ready to come back. And um, Darren, you'll have to do the vote for run the vote for the approval of the timeline. Thanks, right. Dale. We'll, we'll uh, make a uh, record of that for the minutes as well. So I think he stepped away. Okay. So we need a motion to accept the timeline. So moved. Oh, okay. Second. We got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? 
Got a vote, Dave? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. You got them? Yep. All right. Thank you. Brian, what does the pool look like around it with those three? Do you know? Like, do you know the dollar? Uh, so, likely from the EPF, it would be similar to, to what we did for round seven. Mm -hmm. uh, but for um, the additional federal funding, we're going to have to be strategic there and break that out over the course of the next couple of rounds. So, okay. I, I don't agree okay. on that. Okay. And, I mean, it's great. Thanks. Yeah. Excellent. Do you have anyone have anything else on CRF they want to discuss? All right. Next on our list is the Soil Health Climate Resiliency Act of 2022. Um, Harold Van Ness, Joseph, Joseph, sorry if I didn't pronounce it right, but um, I'll let you guys take care of it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to start really quick with uh, an, intro an introduction, I guess, um, to the presentation to refresh everybody on what the, the Soil Health and Climate Resiliency Act um, is and entails. Just very briefly, um, Brian presented to the State Committee on this, I believe, in June of June of 2022. Hold on, I'm not sharing, I am told. Apologies. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so Brian uh, presented on this, uh, the Soil Health and Climate Resiliency Act uh, last June, but wanted to kind of reintroduce it to the state committee and I thought it'd be a good opportunity since we have some guests here uh, to talk about their work. So the Soil Health and Climate Resiliency Act um, was uh, passed by the assembly in May of 2021. Following that, it was, passed, it was passed by the Senate in June of that same year and signed by Governor Hochul on December 22nd of 2021. This act took effect on June 20th, 2022, and includes um, uh, or um, was uh, an amendment to the Ag and Markets Law in the form of Article 11B, which follows our AEM law, which is Article 11A. Um, following uh, the signing of this act, uh, Soil and Water Conservation District Law was also amended to um, you know, tie these two pieces of, of uh, law together. So essentially, uh, this act establishes the soil health program uh, to assist farms in a, improving the health of their soil. It establishes a climate, the Climate Resilient Farming Initiative, which promotes and encourages farmers to reduce the effects of farming on climate change and to adapt to and mitigate the impact of climate change by improving and maintaining water management and soil health and resiliency. There are you know, three uh, different sections of the act, the Soil Health Initiative, the Climate Resilient Farming Initiative, as well as the Soil Health Research Section. Today, we're just gonna be focusing on the Soil Health Initiative. Uh, so in the act, uh, it defines that the Department of Ag and Markets, in cooperation with the State Soil and Water Conservation Committee and other partners, uh, is charged to develop efforts to promote and encourage soil health in urban, suburban, and rural communities by um, all of the following bullets. So by minimizing soil erosion and sedimentation, managing and optimizing soil health to mitigate and adapt to climate change, improving water infiltration rates and water holding capacity of soil, managing healthy cycling of soil nutrients, um, the conducting of stakeholder meetings and opportunities for the public to comment through current partnerships. And lastly, the establish, um, it charges the department to establish appropriate voluntary standards and objectives for soil health and quality. So why that is bolded on the screen today, um, we have guests here uh, with us. Um, Harold Van Ness is a professor of soil and water 
management with extension. You also have Joseph M. Silly, an extension associate, as well as Deborah Ayler, who have um, uh, done some, some work on that last bullet to establish the appropriate voluntary standards and objectives for soil health and quality. So we wanted to invite them here today to share, um, share on their work and where they are in that process. So welcome everyone. And I will, um, I guess, stop sharing my screen or my presentation and uh, I will pull up yours. Do you want to just do a slight advancing or something? Will that work okay for you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. So great. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, it's, a, it's a true pleasure to be here. So again, I'm Harold Van Ness. Uh, Joseph, uh, I'm silly sitting right next to me and Debbie Allen right there. Um, maybe for the, the people out there, maybe raise your hand really uh, <laughs> so that they can see you very clearly. All right. I don't know how far that <laughs> yeah. you say. Um, and then, uh, of course, Judy Suarez, who is, uh, who's been really uh, facilitating a lot of our uh, relationships with the uh, folks here in Albany. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be back. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, sort of alluded to, I, uh, I used to be very involved with the state committee as uh, the representative of the Dean of Cal's, which was uh, Dave Call at that time. As it is uh, about 30 years ago. And uh, those were very exciting times. Uh, the non-point source program was established. Uh, New York City water supply watershed was a really big deal at the time. Uh, Skinny Atlas Lake um, AEM program was developed at the, the tiered uh, assessment approaches and all that. So it's really it's really wonderful to see this expansion into other programs, climate uh, climate smart farming and, and all that. So uh, it's, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, I actually remember uh, a, a, a big uh, program was the, dr the drainage outlet development program, which is basically uh, developing drainage outlets, and uh, but then when the concerns about wetlands, you know, emerged, that uh, that kind of went by the by the wayside. But anyway, so uh, we're here really uh, to talk about soil health, and um, as Bethany introduced, there are certain aspects of the Soil Health and Climate Resiliency Act that uh, relate to to work that we support, and um, and so I'll start out by you know showing kind of the overall schematic of our program. Um, and, you know, so uh, an important part has always been the assessment of soil health. In the very early days, over 20 years ago, we decided that soil health needed to be measured the same way you measure water quality or air quality. Um, and um, so we put a lot of effort into, it, into that, established a soil health laboratory back in 2006, was the, the first anywhere, um, and, you know, worked on methodologies and interpretation. So more recently, uh, in part driven by the, uh, the Soil Health and Climate Resiliency Act, we've uh, put a lot of effort into benchmarking. And that's actually the primary reason why we came here to talk to you. Um, the, although we also will talk about some other program elements, but, but uh, that's what Joseph will be discussing. And that's where we will uh, we really ask for your feedback. Uh, and then uh, we're looking at regenerative solutions uh, from agronomic to uh, like bionutrient processing and reuse and reallocation, which is what Debbie will uh, will present a few slides on. Um, uh, various aspects: uh, organic, conventional, rural, urban, uh, and now, of course, solar being you know a, a, a big interest. So, in terms of the the, the soil health team, so the the three of us, uh, as well as as Matt Ryan, who is a cropping systems uh, professor and uh, Kristen Loria, who, um, who works with him. And so that's sort of the core team, and then we work with a lot of folks, uh, uh, colleagues at Cornell, um, colleagues uh, within the extension system, uh, but notably the, the districts have been very strong partners for us. So we've done a lot of work with, with the districts, uh, NRCS as well. Uh, but when it comes to you know doing field days or other sort of communications, you know, the districts have always been been really strong partners. So I want to make sure that that's, uh, that's noted uh, in, in this meeting. So uh, why don't we go to the next one, Bethany? Yep. So this is uh, uh, just to kind of highlight the fact that we do a lot of communication. So we have a, a, a person, Kitty Gifford, who really helps us with that. 
And on the right, you see our Facebook and Twitter accounts, uh, very, very active, uh, updated on a very regular basis uh, on all, all matters related to soil health and, and our program. Um, a number of other you know, publications, uh, posters of uh, cover crop roots that, that Joseph developed, uh, even a guide on biochar uh, translated into Spanish that, uh, that, that David uh, developed. And so on the left side, we have some of the, you might say, some substantive publications that directly came out of our research. So the ones on the top left are, are kind of typically manuals or you know, other, other reports. For example, on the characterization of soil health for New York, uh, we have an organic uh, no-till soybean guide that, that Matt Ryan developed. Uh, the, the publication on the roadmap from 2017 that we updated. Um, and then the lower left is actually, and we have that also as a, as a handout, is um, our, uh, something that we started this, this, this past year, and those are policy briefs that basically are kind of targeted towards audiences like yourself and maybe some of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the legislators who we also, you know, try to deal with. And so these policy briefs are, are basically two pagers, uh, and you'll, you'll see them, you know, on the, on the second page here. Um, and, and they address a particular issue where we also very clearly identify policy considerations. You know, what are sort of the, the key issues that a decision maker should be aware of, or, or maybe what direction should policies go towards, right? So we, we started out with uh, one on Long Island. Um, that's a, a lot of based on Debbie's work, because she worked on Long Island at the uh, research station there in Suffolk County. Um, and Long Island soils are, are different. Soils are different, climate is different, cropping systems are different, right? Uh, the second one was the update of the roadmap. And so a number of you were involved in the meeting that we held this past winter, uh, where we basically tried to get all the stakeholders involved and update uh, the roadmap and sort of what are some of the new issues that need to be addressed. And you can see that, you know, the, the four or the five bullet points that came out of that. So we try to summarize it, keep it really succinct. And then the one that uh, just came out actually this past week is one on the drivers of soil health and strategies for enhancement. And that kind of leads into some of the work that uh, Joseph will, uh, will discuss. Uh, next one, uh, Bethany. So um, the, uh, the other aspect of our program is that we do a lot with uh, with uh, outreach, you know, field uh, field days. You can see uh, this past uh, this past summer we had what uh, nine field days, I believe, right? Um, you can see on the upper left the soil health trailer that we uh, took over from the, the uh, pasture program um, and relabeled it, and we use that a lot. Every field day, just about, we we take the trailer and we have it set up to do all kinds of uh, erosion runoff, demonstrations, uh, you know, penetrometers, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, in the lower left, we also have a, uh, a micro-grant program that Debbie initiated, where we uh, basically facilitate others to do uh, small amounts, uh, you know, a small you know, projects. Sometimes it pays for travel or something like that. And, uh, and then, you know, various uh, field days and a lot of virtual meetings. Uh, so we... Uh, uh, Joseph, a few years ago, started a advanced sort of health course, which we turned into a virtual certificate course. Uh, I think we've trained a lot of people in, in New York uh, over, over time, and, and this has kind of, kind of become an international event, and uh, it's quite, quite well subscribed. We actually have one coming up starting uh, just in a couple of weeks. Um, so, uh, and, and, uh, so a lot of this is supported uh, by the funding that we are receiving. Uh, from um, the legislature and Brian and Jennifer are uh, basically our, our program managers. So they, they supervise um, our project and provide us with, with feedback. Uh, next one. Um, Can I ask a question really? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, on the, the mini grants program, is that something you offer like every year on an annual basis? It's been, we've done it two years now. Debbie, why don't you? Yeah, we've done it for, for two years now and there's, often been way more interest in this program than we've actually been able to support. So we're providing a small, or allocating a small amount of funds for this, and it's up to 2,500 for basically 
small scale um, uh, projects that are soil health related. And we try and provide support, you know, underserved farmers um, or ones that will um, provide information to a number of people. So not just a single farm, but a farm that may be willing to host a field day themselves and bringing other farmers or younger, new and beginning farmers to try and basically be an extension almost of ourselves because we can only run so many field days, but if you can hold an event, more people are learning about soil health and, and working within that space. And then it's also up to $500 for small travel grants for folks who would like to attend a soil health related event, but maybe um, are unable to rent a van or um, skip a day of work around being able to go educate themselves on this topic. So. Yeah, oh, that's neat. Um, is it like only a certain um, set of people that can apply or like would soil and water districts be eligible if they wanted to hold an event? We've, we haven't excluded anyone from it. Um, you know, we, we are three who um, review all the applications that come in and it's been individual farms, it's been nonprofit or organizations, it's been cooperative extension, it's been soil and water districts. So it's pretty much everyone um, is eligible. Um, and we kind of will review them and then come together and decide who we think um, has the best yeah. applications for those. Great, thank but you it's been much. it's been a great way to really support people who might not be able to um, engage directly in research or or an educational opportunity in this space. It complements a lot of the, 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 the projects and programs that we administer here through our economic point of CRF on a larger scale. It complements that really nicely. Great, thank you. Yeah, there's a real demand for yeah basically small amounts of money that really goes a long way. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I, sh I should mention, uh, and I failed to do that, Michael Gloss is also a member of our team. He's, uh, he uh, does most of the work with the trailer, but he's also, he's an organic farmer and he's been a really strong connection for us with the NOFA New York uh, mm -hmm. group, so that's right. So, um, so continuing on, so a lot of work has done, uh, related to sort of data analytics. So we have this, this great soil health lab. We've had many tens of thousands of samples that have been processed, uh, and a lot of them from New York. And so that has allowed us, mostly Joseph, to uh, basically start the characterization of, of uh, soil health in New York. So it's, it's really sort of a, a first anywhere where we do an inventory. It's a resource inventory, you might say. And then we follow that uh, with a Long Island specific uh, effort because you know the situation in Long Island is, is different. Yes. Next one, though. and so that sort of uh, initiated a lot of our thinking around soil health and 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 how we uh, can think about approaching soil health challenges. So uh, and we have to sort of look at it in the context of these three major factors that impact soil health. So one is sort of the natural factor, the intrinsic factor. Is it a clay loam <laughs> soil or a loamy sand? Is it poorly drained, well drained? Um, you know, things like that. Is the forest derived or grassland derived? So that's basically the, the part that you cannot control, that is sort of given. Uh, the second component is the land use, or mostly in agriculture, it's a cropping system. But, you know, you could also say urban or non-urban. Uh, but uh, within agriculture, you know, is it a, is it a vineyard? Is it a, a cash grain, corn, soybean, wheat operation? Is it a, a dairy farm? Is it a, is it an orchard? Um, is it a processing vegetable? And that really, we found that that has a big impact on the soil health, which, which uh, uh, Joseph will, will elaborate on. And then within that system, right, so you have relatively limited control. You're a dairy farmer. Uh, you're not going to all of a sudden, you know, next year become an apple grower, right? So you're kind of more or less locked into that and maybe even in the long run change that. But within intrinsic and land use, you have your management. Right, and that's the that's where you what you can change the most. You can, you know, adopt cover crops. You can uh, go to no-till. You can uh, maybe bring bio-nutrients or you know compost or whatever biochar onto your fields. You know things like that. And so that's really uh, the management part. The other two you're a little bit more locked into, right? So the when we do the benchmarking, we account for these intrinsic and land use factors, which which we'll discuss further. So let's let's go to the next slide. Uh, so before we go sort of into those details, I also wanted to show that we're looking sort of at soil health from a spatial aspect. And this is uh, Valentina Rubio's work. We just finished her, her PhD this summer. 
uh, where we look at uh, New York State as a whole and uh, using sort of machine learning techniques. And we look at things like the intrinsic soil properties, you know, from say soil survey data uh, to, uh, you know, looking at things like texture and all that, uh, looking at climate factors, temperature, precipitation and all that, and then looking at all those land use factors uh, using say cropland data, data layer. So, you know, is it a vineyard, is it a, a cash grain operation, et cetera. And so we're trying to understand what the drivers are of soil health and how we can look at that in a spatial context. And so one of the one of the reasons why we're doing this is we want to better understand and be able to predict where you may have soil health problems, but also what opportunities are there, there to address soil health within a certain area. For example, having a, uh, an, a farm operation that has excess carbon and nutrients like a like a dairy farm. Right. Uh, are those then opportunities for a nearby, say, processing vegetable operation? to use some of those, uh, those bio-nutrients, you might say, and, and, and how can we facilitate that? Do, do they need to be processed? Do they need to be transported? Um, or maybe, you know, there, there needs to be regional educational initiatives on, you know, cover crop adoption or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of is driving some of this work. And so what you'll hear from Debbie and, and Joseph sort of feeds into that. So, so one more, um, and this is, uh, uh, so one of the outcomes this is the overall soil health index. So this is an index that represents the biological, physical, and chemical properties of the soil uh, for this region. So we focus kind of on Western New York, so the, the Lake Erie, uh, Ontario Plain, and the Southern Tier. And you can see uh, that actually in the area that sort of is our primary agricultural land, which is in the, in the plain, uh, we see that the soil health outcomes are actually less favorable at this point in time than they are in the areas that we always consider to be marginal land, which is more the hillsides and all that. And the reason is that a lot of intensive agricultural production has had an impact on the health of the soil, uh, while sort of in the southern tier you see more pastures and that kind of agricultural use. So it does kind of point out that there are real regional differences that the anthropogenic effects, you might say, the fact that the, that the land is being used for, say, intensive cropping production is showing up in terms of the soil health outcomes, right? So compared to the natural soil, we see this degradation, and we know that cropping systems are an important factor in that. So with that, I'll hand it over to Deb. Um, next slide. Thanks, Harold. Um, so I'm just going to spend a couple slides on an area we're kind of expanding into in our thinking and working at with projects. And it's really in collaboration with a couple other faculty at Cornell, namely Rebecca Nelson and Johannes Lehman. And it's around this idea of a circular bionutrient economy. And I'm not sure how familiar everyone is um, with that term, but it's really the idea of no longer looking at nutrient sources and, and waste um, in a linear fashion but more in a, in a circular way that they're all connected. connected. Um, so basically thinking about greater circularity across the agri-food system, um, and not just within New York State, but this is something nationally and globally as well, and there's a lot of interest within this area right now. Um, and as Harold alluded to, it's really this idea of there's processing, um, reuse, and reallocation or redistribution of both nutrients, but also carbon sources. Um, and that this can really boost um, various issues um, from the sustainability, um, socioeconomic standpoint, and environmental um, side of things within New York State and, and beyond. So just a couple images on the bottom there of how we can think about reusing and diverting things like urine, which are a, um, a problem, particularly in certain parts of New York State, um, and recovering the nutrients, mainly uh, nitrogen, from those um, and then the, the picture on the bottom right is um, the biochar, the dairy manure to biochar project that Johannes um, is leading with funding from NYSERDA. Um, and that's on a dairy farm in, in central New York, which um, is, is producing biochar. Um, and there's lots of interest in that, um, not just from like kind of the carbon sequestration and carbon negative side of things, but also from the storage and handling um, as another opportunity to reduce quantities of dairy manure on, on large scale farms. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a, just a simple 
really basic schematic of kind of how we're thinking about it um, and thinking of basically changing a mindset from waste to resources. And with resources, we're putting a value on something. But there are many opportunities across the state um, to build carbon in our soils, improve soil health um, by using sources, many different sources. And these are going to vary across the state, whether you're on Long Island, Western New York, Northern New York, anywhere. Um, in, in their quantities and the types. Um, and then there's going to be some type of processing around them. And there's many, again, different, different ways that these organic, raw organic materials can be processed into um, more valuable materials that then can be reapplied to the land. Um, these can be farms, rural, urban farms, um, various scales, other green spaces, and also for residential. Um, areas as well. Um, and we really know through through resource uh, research that um, certain fields and certain farms are going to benefit to a greater extent than others through applications of organic materials. So it's really targeting where we are going to be utilizing these organic waste materials. But it's an idea that there's lots of opportunities to recover these materials and then cycle them back in a more valuable, more stable form. Obviously, there's economics, logistics across the state, or the, and these are going to vary across the urban and rural areas, um, but there's many benefits that can be observed. Next slide, please. Just want to highlight a couple of projects that we have gone ongoing in New York State within this space, and it's in collaboration. Um, this first project is with the Rich Earth Institute out of Vermont, and it's funded by the Northeast SARE program. Um, and this is a trial that's being replicated in Vermont, but actually down at the Cornell Research Farm on Long Island. Um, and a critical part of this project is collecting information, both on the field research, the natural science side of things, but also the farmer perceptives, perception um, and the social science side of this. So you know, are farmers actually going to be willing to adopt a practice like this around this more circular bionutrient economy? So it's looking at biochar um, and from both woody feedstocks as well as the biosolids biochar as well as pasteurized urine um, to see are there opportunities to replace synthetic nutrients with more organic forms of carbon and nutrients. Next slide, please. Last slide I'm going to highlight is um, some additional funding that's been provided for this project by the Food Foundation for Food and Agriculture um, that is going to extend the length of this project by another five years and brings in um, some researchers from the University of Michigan um, to really look at the PFAS side of things. Because mm -hmm. I think everyone knows that PFAS is of, of really great concern among the agricultural community and beyond. Um, but it's really expanding this and, and looking at the soil health side of things but also, um, as I mentioned, the social side of things. So just want to highlight some, some research that we are actively involved in um, within this space. And I will turn it over to Joseph to talk about the benchmarking. Can I ask uh, one quick question yeah. from the previous I, slide? No, absolutely. Uh, torification. Yeah. What is that? So it's a similar process to pyrolysis, but okay. it's done at lower temperatures. Okay. So they're below 300 degrees Celsius. Thank you. Yep. You can think of drying, heating and drying, torification, which is a little bit higher temperature, yeah. and then pyrolysis is with yet higher temperature. Okay. So with drying, you don't really change the chemical structure. With pyrolysis, you change the chemical structure a lot. But torification is kind of in between. Yes. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. So I have another question related to PFAS. So do we know if pyrolysis will destroy PFAS or PFOS? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so Julie's question was around, will pyrolysis destroy PFAS compounds and all the research research that's coming out to date, which is being done by various organizations showing that pyrolysis destroys over 95% of measurable PFAS compounds. And so it's being really studied extensively, not just at the university level, but by the US EPA around its ability to mitigate PFAS. So it will be safely um, applied to lands. And, and that project is looking at it in New York State. 
Yeah, I, I would, as a farmer, be concerned about applying anything from a human urine standpoint without some some type of guarantee that I wouldn't be getting a, a, an unforeseen result later on from a negative that would be still in the urine. And uh, so yeah, I'm thank, sure how thanks, that would be Taylor. addressed. That's, but. A, that's a really good point, and I think um, this work um, is is trying to dive into that concern. We know that we know that's a concern by farmers, and that's absolutely something um, we want to make sure can be safely used before farmers would adopt it. In general, we we believe that with all these organic materials, you have all these multiple options and that that there isn't any good guidance on you know what is the most beneficial for manure versus wood chips versus you know food waste and so we're going to try in the next couple of years to really have a major focus um, on, on trying to provide better guidance on um, you know because with different processing methodologies you have different benefits but also sometimes disadvantages whether you might lose nutrients or gain nutrients and so right now it's a little bit of a wild west out there and people say you know that they, they, they like the concept but it, there isn't any good guidance on what is really the best approach for a particular environment you know and it depends on whether the source material is available or not and you know all of those kind of things yeah it's it's thinking you know like dairy farms have excess nutrients they need to get rid of it but are there ways to um, safely handle those and, and process that material. But then a lot of orchards, for example, have access to wood chips. Right. Is there a way for them to utilize those wood chips and improve soil health and things? You, you have to take into account also the cost of application because it's pretty easy to drive around a fertilizer spreader and put fertilizer on a field. And, and primarily, I mean, for um, crop farmers that don't want to have access to manure. Um, it has to be cost effective for the farmer to put on also not, Cutting in not and just out um, beneficial um, or you won't like it. Yeah, that's the way it is with my connection. But um, it, you have to take into cost, uh, cost effectiveness of application of it for the soil nutrients. Uh, it's easy to spread fertilizer on a field and cost effective for the actual application of it. And how cost effective and intensive is the application of alternatives? And this is primarily for crop farmers that don't have access to manure. Um, we rent ground from crop farmers that after wheat, we put in sorghum. And it is shocking to us the amount of nutrients their fields need to grow good crops because they don't apply what we are applying with the cow manure. So it's yeah. something to think about. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll get started. It's really exciting to be here to share our work on the effects of soil type, cropping system, and region on soil health outcomes across the state. And as Harold was mentioning, this really dovetails well with um, the New York State Soil Health and Climate Resiliency legislation that put in to have um, these voluntary soil health standards. So we've been calling these production environment soil health benchmarks that kind of bring together that basically would encompass all these factors, soil type, cropping system, and region. So for context, and Harold alluded to a little bit, um, our lab uses the comprehensive assessment of soil health um, tool to basically as holistically assess um, soil health. The test basically provides measurement of biological and physical indicators in addition to routinely measured chemical indicators um, that those link to important processes that, that, that shape soil functioning. So basically, we have yeah, four, four physical measures, four biological, four chemical. There's a measured value and, and the big work that we, the lab and, and the group's been doing the last 20 years is providing interpretations of what, what those values mean um, in a score or rating. And you can see that kind of stoplight color coding rating, which basically helps the farmer identify constraints and understands and helps provide guidance to management. So that this is just page one of the report, but the other pages link to management. And this um, approach, one is one of the first approaches um, to assess soil health comprehensively um, in the world and is now um, a very active laboratory. 
doing about 4,000 samples every year, 20,000 in the past five years, and is part of a lot of major research and outreach initiatives across the country. So Harold also alluded to this. We've um, really been thinking in this context of these three major factors of soil health, the intrinsic things like soil texture that we have no control over, cropping system does lock us into certain types of rotations and management systems. And then within each of those cropping systems, there's a whole spectrum of activities that exist across the landscape. There's the farmers that have been doing no-till and cover crops for the last 20 years and the farmers that are newer to this. Um, so next slide. So um, first we're gonna be presenting on the effects of inherent soil properties and we've dialed really in on texture as the, the most important inherent soil property shaping physical, biological, chemical functioning of the soil. So next slide, please. So we've known for a long time, um, and, but this is data specific to New York State, that finer textured soils are able to store more organic matter against constant decomposition process in the soil, basically able to help protect it. Additionally, it's able to store more labile organic carbon and um, microbial, have more microbial respiration and of course, textured soil. So this information is really fundamental if we want to be able to assess the effects of management, which is our goal. So for example, um, if you have 3.5% organic matter, 3.7, that would be really great for a coarse textured soil, say a sandy loam, but that's just average for a silt loam. So having this information is critical to be able to act on organic matter, organic carbon, and some of these other biological indicators. Next slide. So we've also been um, contributing at the national level with um, USDA, ARS, and NRCS, and, and researchers across the country to be able to um, use our database to help um, inform this interpretation for the whole country. So no matter where you are in the whole country, you can submit a sample. And when you have the whole country, you need a little bit more information than just texture. So we have soil type as well, and then mean annual temperature and precipitation. So um, this is going to be the interpret soil health interpretation tool, basically, that the feds and the NRCS are, are going with. This work was published for Soil Organic Carbon in 2001, and the paper for all the other indicators is probably going to be available early next year. Uh, 2021. 2021, sorry. So yeah, so this is um, a scoring curve um, with the example of a mollusol or grassland soil from Iowa with a silt loam texture, which is what that T3 means, and suborder basically stands for this grassland soil, and a very similar temp um, climate to central New York. Basically, this scoring curve and, and this data set enables you to have an interpretation because 2% um, soil organic carbon means about a score of, of 46 here. For other parts of the country, that meet, might mean a, mean a score of 95 or, or even a lower score. So this is basically a very detailed um, framework to interpret soil health in the context of a lot of, of, the, of the most important inherent properties. So now we're moving on to the factors, uh, the human factors, and as soil scientists, we might consider humans as the six soil forming factors. Um, <laughs> we can do a lot. Um, so we're gonna be looking at the effects of cropping system and biomass cycling here. Um, and, and you can really back out and think of how cropping systems and humans impact soil health with these two extreme examples from a, na a natural system or a pasture system where basically all of the above ground and below ground biomass is produced and cycled in place. We don't have any disturbance from tillage, uh, sloughing off of roots and active mycorrhizal fungi. And on the other side, um, you can think of a cash crop. And can, there's an animation for this one. So can you do it? Yes, which one? The, um, one more. And then it should. Ah. Perfect. Uh, and then on the other side, you can think of a more intensive system where we're using um, the ground a little bit harder to grow um, cash grains or processing vegetables, where um, maybe we're are, we're not growing, we're having we're only growing living plants for a certain point, portion of the season, and maybe 50 to 70 percent of the carbon and nutrients 
is being exported in the form of drought harvest. We're also having a lot of CO2 losses from tillage, if there is some, and potentially erosion. And we're potentially only returning 30 to 50 percent of, of that biomass back to the system. So um, commonly, um, we replace the nutrients, but if we don't also replace the carbon that's annually lost, then we have soil degradation. So next. So um, actually, kind of when I started my position five years ago, I started to delve into the database looking at these effects of soil type and cropping system. So here's a earlier, um, some earlier work we did. Now we've expanded this to six cropping systems, including orchards. So we're comparing the effects of annual grain, corn, soybean, wheat rotations, dairy cropping systems, corn silage and alfalfa rotations, um, permanent pastures. And then we have a distinction between basically larger scale processing vegetable operations and then mixed scale kind of market, market garden, maybe organic, um, growing a lot of different crops in, in an acre or two or, or 10 acres. Um, so next slide, please. So I'm just going to share some of these basic results. And you can see in the little uh, left-hand corner here, this is loam texture. So we're only, we need to consider that first um, inherent or intrinsic soil factor. So we're looking at the effects of cropping system within a certain soil type. And here you can see that pastures and mixed vegetables are able to just maintain, on average, higher organic matter then annual grain and processing vegetables, dairy systems are somewhat intermediate. Um, the orchard story is interesting, and we can get to that if we have some time. Um, but basically, there are systems where more biomass inputs are going into the system, and for pastures, we have the basically no disturbance in tillage. Next slide. Um, so we can also look at aggregate stability across um, these different cropping systems, and these undisturbed pastures have much higher aggregate stability on average than all of these other cropping systems, more than two, two times at least, um, basically kind of showing and lining up with research that continuous living roots and their associated mycorrhizal fungi really help to build and maintain these structures. Um, also, interestingly, we have some within our annual conventionally tilled systems, maybe mixed vegetable systems, which I showed you before, maintain a little bit higher organic matter, having higher aggregate stability than processing vegetables. So even if there is tillage in the system, maintaining better soil health, higher organic matter will give you greater structural stability and resilience to, to big rainfall events. What, what, what contributes to the, to the greater uh, benchmarking for soil health with mixed vegetable operations? You might have said it, I might have missed it. Um, that the, the bigger outcomes. These are mostly, it's mostly a spatial scale. So these are small, smaller farms, um, yeah. mixed, um, growing multiple crops in a, in a smaller, or in a, in a, in an area. So yeah. like if they were doing a soil test, they, they wouldn't be able to, they would have to put multiple things, which is where the mix comes from. Okay. Um, whereas the processing is basically large. Scale. Well, don't certain vegetables add more to the soil yeah. than say a grain crop or yeah. something? Cause I mean, I know just like planting radishes or something is a huge benefit to the soils compared to. Yeah. Say, also, a lot of these operations are organic, so they bring in compost right. or you know basically organic nutrient sources. And yeah, yeah smaller in scale, so they can bring in those right. organic. Um, even even within say annual grains, we see differences in in crops. For example, soybean is is a tough crop on the soil because. It, doesn't have a lot of biomass. It's a relatively small crop compared to, say, corn, right? So even though you harvest the grains, corn will still give you a lot of biomass if you leave the residue, right? Not, not corn silage, but corn for grain. Soybean is much tougher because you don't leave much residue, so you don't give much carbon back to the soil. So the, the amount of biomass and carbon that you cycle is really a critical component as well as the sort of the perenniality. So this is actually the, the third uh, policy document, that is the one that just came out of that, it's actually on the, on the back here. We kind of talk about these driving forces of soil health. And so in a mixed system that plays itself out through 
bringing carbon and nutrients into the farm, but also growing the white crops that help to maintain the, the soil. So next animation, I think this relates to common soil health, probably the best soil health demonstration to get people interested in soil health, whether they're school, school kids or your neighbor. Um, and you could probably reliably take some aggregates crumbs under a pasture soil and compare it to something that's been recently tilled and, and show this um, very easy demonstration. So, slide, please. so with this huge database from New York State of different <coughs> soil types, property systems, and regions, we can provide basically more nuanced interpretation to the farmer. So here are some examples of some benchmarking um, figures that I made for a farmer, a dairy farmer. The name of the farm is obscured, so he has Moose Dairy Farm. Um, basically kind of showing that his one field, 37, was, was much higher than the average dairy field in a loam texture, which is good positive reinforcement for him who's been doing at no-tills and really invested in cover crops for a long time. And his aggregate stability is one of the highest within that, um, within that pool of samples. So this is kind of, yeah, important information for the farmers. To, farmers want to be compared to their peers and um, to, have, to know how you're doing compared to people that are doing similar rotations on similar soil and similar parts of the state as you. So next slide. So the past one was benchmarking for the farmer, and we've also been working on benchmarking infographics for the consumer. So here's a pilot. Um, this is you know, working with Norwich Meadows Farm um, in Norwich, um, and he's, he's one of the yeah, people that, that's, that's piloting this approach and probably going to be one of the first people to use this. But this is basically for farms that are very consumer-facing, farmers' markets, um, direct-to-consumer, that they, with, with all our interest as a society on, on soil health and soil carbon and, and its relation to climate change, that this is an important marketing strategy and consumers are interested in, in aligning their purchasing with um, understanding of, of, of practices on the ground. So here's an example that they might use on their website or might have a big printout at farmer's market to, sh to communicate how their, how their management practices are impacting soil health and soil carbon. So um, now connecting to the New York State Soil Health and Climate Resiliency legislation, which is really exciting, um, um, basically wrote in to, um, to help um, the need for having these appropriate voluntary soil health standards that are relevant for soil type, property system, and region. So we've been working to help um, produce the scientific foundation that that, that can be built off of. So yeah, setting benchmarks for soil health is really important, and we've done that for air and water, but we haven't really done that for soil yet. So if, um, it can be very beneficial for multiple angles. It can help farmers calibrate their management. It can fit into different policy efforts. But as we showed in some of this research, the soil health goals voluntary standards, benchmarks, whatever the language you use, really needs to be adapted to region, really needs to be adapted to soil type and cropping system. Um, so here is um, basically where our thinking is currently at on these production environment soil health benchmarks, which, we're called, which the acronym is PESH, benchmarks. So here, um, and that production environment soil health um, term really brings together, the production environment brings together thinking about soil type, cropping system, and region um, all together, because they're all important in understanding the context of soil health interpretation. So here's an example. I could have made this for any different system in soil type and region, but here's an example for annual grain systems on loam soils in upstate New York. And we can basically, um, define these benchmarks as the 75th or 90th percentile. We could do it in different ways, but that's a really good starting place. So 75th percentile at 3.2% organic matter, basically 25% of those farmer fields are able to achieve that. At the 90th percentile, then 10% of those are able to achieve that. So next slide. 
So here's kind of an example and next one. So let's say a farmer submits a sample and their field tests about 2.5% organic matter. There's a clear, um, clear pathway and a clear interpretation that there's a lot of, of similar farmers, a lot of their peers that are able to achieve higher soil health outcomes, potentially using reduced tillage or cover cropping to get there. So you can, can show where you're at compared to your peers and um, it would be easy to connect you with folks that are, 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 are achieving that and shows that, that those are realistic targets. So here's basically um, what the set, the, those hash benchmarks for the 75th percentile would be for loam textures across these different cropping systems. So we could have made that scoring curve for any of these cropping systems or soil texture, soil textures or regions. Um, so next slide, please. And but we also think it's really important to have a kind of a universal benchmark. So we pastures are probably the best systems. And in soil science, we always say that's kind of a real, the, the best benchmark of, of what that system could achieve, what that certain soil type could achieve in that, in, within those intrinsic properties. So here's a big um, database of, of continuous pasture systems in, in, upstate, in upstate New York, and you can see um, what those benchmarks would be. So, Basically, with this approach, we'd have a benchmark that's, that's realistic for your cropping system, and then an aspirational kind of higher benchmark for what, what your intrinsic soil properties could achieve as evidenced under a pasture system. Um, so next slide. We got a couple of years ago, and with Debbie joining the team, we got a really cool opportunity to compare the same soil type and cropping system um, between upstate New York and Long Island, and it was really kind of jumped out at us how different the soil health outcomes are, even within the same soil texture class and the same um, cropping system. So really shows that regional PESH benchmarks are needed for Long Island and the rest of New York State. Our analysis didn't show that there was more than those two necessary yet, um, but basically coarser textured soils, uh, can hold on to less organic matter in warmer climate, kind of speeds up the natural cycling. Um, so next slide, and this is where I'll hand it back over to Harry. Yeah, so, so thank you, Joseph. So um, this is, is a, shows you a, more or less a timeline, you might say, of, of our approach. So given the fact that we have been asked through the legislation to work on these voluntary standards, or, uh, so our approach has been to first Established the benchmarks. So um, and um, so we did the uh, research, uh, the analytics. Uh, we have that published in the literature. Uh, we felt it was important that it was peer reviewed. Um, so and we've been in the process of presenting this to stakeholder groups through field days and you know uh, some of the other like virtual meetings and all that uh, farmer meetings. So the ones uh, that you see a check mark is basically where we've made a lot of accomplishments. And so the next step is to talk to policymakers and agencies. So that's why we're here. Uh, and um, so uh, because we, we really uh, recognize that, um, you know, this is this is unplowed ground. Excuse the, the pun, but, you know, nobody has anywhere in the world has established benchmarks for soil health. And so we want to be very careful because, as you know, once you establish benchmarks and they become standards, they take a life of their own. Uh, and uh, so we want to be very careful. We want to uh, present this. We hope that people understand uh, what, what we did and really put this up for public review uh, through meetings like this, uh, through uh, you know, other electronic communications. We'll put it on our, our you know, Facebook, Twitter account, on our website. Uh, we'll uh, we'll plan to organize a virtual meeting uh, where uh, we present this and allow for discussions um, and uh, and then uh, receive comments and uh, refine the concept if if uh, people have certain uh, uh, ideas about that and then uh, and then to basically kind of report back to quote unquote decision makers and agencies or so people like yourselves and. Uh, in fact, this afternoon, Julie has already set up an, 
and a schedule for us to, to meet some people downtown, um, and then to, to fund, uh, publish the, the, the final benchmarks. And, uh, but one, one important policy de decision is, um, is, is how do you go from benchmarks to standards, right? So, so do you want to make, say, a 75th percentile of a peer group environment? Uh, do you want to make that a standard, or you want to make that an, uh, an aspirational goal or something like that? So the, um, yeah. the, the legislation says voluntary standards. And so uh, I'm not sure how much thought went into that particular term, because standard is you know, kind of like nitrate in, in, uh, in groundwater, right? It's 10 parts per million, and you know, it actually makes a difference whether you're at 9.9 .9 versus 10.1. It actually triggers a whole bunch of things, right? So, um, so we're, we, we really want to have that discussion and the public discourse around this issue so that everybody truly understands what's uh, what's involved what you know it's a slightly different approach in in that we are looking basically at at a peer group comparison right so we're, we say within a, a particular production environment let's say uh, an annual grain system or you know corn soybeans wheat or whatever you we are comparing fields to other fields and we have a good representation of uh, the conditions in New York State. We, we have samples from really great fields. We have samples from really terrible fields and everything in between. So we can define that population. It's kind of like looking at people's height. You know, kind of, we, we would define that population so we can say this is where you are in this broader population, right? So that's the, the approach that, that, that we're taking. Um, and then, you know, uh, like Joseph said, there's sort of a universal benchmark, which is sort of the ideal situation, which we define as pastures. And then there's sort of the, the peer environment, you know, where you, you know, uh, literally are comparing apples to apples and, and that you, that you're not comparing apples to soybeans or, you know, that you're, that you're basically doing it within the same environment. So we, we really would like to, if, if there is some time, we'd like to get some feedback from, from the state committee. And, uh, and any advice you can give us also, not only on, the, on what we presented in terms of the benchmarking, but also on this process, if you have any suggestions on how we should go about this. We've, we've never done this, uh, this kind of a thing before. Um, and it, and you know, keep in mind that this will, be, this will set some precedent, uh, not only in New York, but uh, in other places as well. So we wanna really do it right. Yeah. Um... The one thing that like really stands out to me is the fact, well, animal agriculture has been coming under a lot of pressure from climate activists and stuff over the past several years. Um, what your data shows me is that the absolute best approach is a mixture between both animal ag and you know crop and vegetable farming. You know, there's a lot of people that want to get rid of animal ag completely um, and just, you know, we can get all our protein from, from, you know, crops and vegetables. And what this shows me is, you know, that their data is not complete because the soil health shows completely the opposite. You know, the pasture lands or rotational grazing is probably one of the best things you can do as far as agriculture is concerned um, as compared to, you know, all plant-based processed all, vegetables. Yeah. Right. yeah, processed vegetables actually have the worst outcome. Yep. Exactly, and that, and you never see that in their arguments. <laughs> right. yeah, no, it's, and it's never taken, and a lot of people know that, farmers know that. Um, but we don't, I don't know as if we've actually had the data to prove it. You know, and this, this is, I don't know, this is great data <laughs> showing that. Because I mean, we have, I mean, the mayor of New York wants to go to he you know meatless Mondays or whatever and he wants to get rid of you know whole milk in the well they already have gotten rid of whole milk in the in the um, schools but he, he you know he's he wants to push people away from animal agriculture when for you know a lot of it is environmental reasons when that's not necessarily the, the complete picture right you know, and this, uh, this it's, it's, I don't know, at least it's great part of the, part of the picture, right there. I mean, there are some aspects of animal agriculture that, 
you know, of course, are concerned, and, and but there's other aspects that are right are beneficial, and the, at least to have a balanced discussion. This shows me that a, a, a balance between the two yeah. is really the ideal situation. The, the integrated crop livestock system, right? Yeah. Exactly, which is our dairy model. In New York State. The, da the dairy model, and that's I mean, I, I don't know, but I'm assuming that's why some of the dairy crops are a little bit better because they use manure as part of their yep. rotation, so that shows that they're you know. Crops, their soil health is a little bit better than straight um, crop farms. I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming that. No, no, uh, it, it, it's interesting because a, a dairy cropping system is, is very fascinating from that perspective because corn silage is probably one of the worst crops because you're removing all of the biomass. Right. Right. But then if you rotate it with a perennial forage crop, right, and you apply manure, then all of a sudden you kind of make up for that deficit. Exactly. Right? So, yeah. so the a dairy system is, is very interesting. We also think that New York can really take advantage of the diversity of agricultural systems, yeah. right, where we have dairy farms near uh, uh, corn soybean operations. Actually, uh, Valentina, who did sort of that spatial work, uh, we did see that a comparison between Cayuga County, southern Cayuga County, and uh, and Seneca County, and it's an interesting comparison because, um, as you know, they're on both sides of Cayuga Lake. So they're, they're actually almost identical soils and all that, but Cayuga County has a lot of uh, more diversity and a lot of livestock base, a lot of dairy farms in Cayuga County. Uh, Seneca County actually has very few dairy farms. It's mostly cash grain. And so we actually did an, uh, a hypothetical case where we said, what if Seneca County agriculture looked like Cayuga County agriculture? And what would be the impact of that on soil health? So you would be able to boost soil health with more integrated you know, crop livestock systems. And New York is very well positioned to do that because we have this, this tremendous diversity in our state. We're not like Iowa, you know, where you have corn, soybeans, and, and pigs, right? Uh, and, and some chickens, <laughs> uh, but you know we, we we have and we can take advantage of that. The so like with Debbie's work, you're looking at these organic sources. So if there are farms that have more nutrients than they need, you know because they have you know they import feed and all that. Well, if there's a nearby farm, a processing vegetable farm, uh, and they can use some of that that manure, then that would overall be a win-win situation, right? So. We have this fantastic opportunity to be a model in this state to, to, you know, because it is remarkable that we have farms that have excess nutrients and carbon and we have these processing vegetable operations that are starving of carbon, you might say, you know, to use a, a, a term. So, well, and they're often very close to each other. Urban areas are really, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of wood chips coming out of urban areas, a lot of food waste coming out of urban, you know, it's like, a lot of opportunities around that as well. I have a question. I can't quite recall what the benchmarks will be used for that was identified in legislation. And I ask because I think the nuance that Darren brings up is important from the, the data and then how to be able to translate that to a process, if it's going to be used in some sort of ranking process. Like those tend to be, you want a layer of complication, but also you want a, a standard that's more applicable to a broader group. And so I just, can't remember how, how that how those fit together sometimes. And yeah, I mean, that's really that's, that's a key question. And also for us, the legislation just says Cornell Cal's develop voluntary standards for soil health, <coughs> basically paraphrasing, but it's almost literally. Actually, it says it there, establish appropriate voluntary standards and objectives okay. for soil health. So, so, so it's, it's, it's kind of an open, it has an open answer, right? So well, what is a voluntary standard? Is it just benchmarking? Um, so we can do that. We've done that, right? And then the objectives around that. So we're saying, well, maybe the 75th percent or the 99th percent should be an objective, right? So it, you know, the, the, the folks in the NRCS use the term, uh, and in the districts, they will, uh, resource concern, right? So it's, it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you have, if you're, if you're, Nitrate levels in groundwater is 12. That's a resource concern because it's above 10, which is the standard, right? So, so if your, uh, let's say your organic matter levels are um, 2.4, and you're on that, that can you maybe go back to that uh, uh, one of the previous slides, of the one that had the curve for this? Yeah, this one here. So if you're if you're 
you know, below that sort of that optimum level and you need to be brought up. This, is a, this would be a resource concern, right? That's what you would call a resource concern. Yeah. And how you then, it's like your erosion rate is above uh, 2T, you know, or something like that. That's been a standard in, so th this, is, this is where we really want some feedback uh, from the broader community, starting with you folks here. Um, well, what do you think <laughs> this should be, right? I mean, um, yeah, yeah. The resource concern, NRCS, in, in our perspective with AEM, is really about the impact to the surrounding environment, less about the impact of the particular resource of the farm. This does change things a little bit, and we'd be looking at as a resource concern in soil health. We don't know if that resource concern is impacting the watershed. Well, we would know through analysis and in other types of planning, or we wouldn't necessarily know whether it's um, a less resilient farm field, you know, due to extreme precipitation. I guess those are some of the ways that we might need to translate the soil health resource concern to like external pressures, you know, like erosion rates and, and absorption rates right. and, and all of that. So I can see where we could integrate it into our AEM planning tools, dealing with cropland conservation, um, and of course, nutrient management, 590, and, and other um, uh, planning resources that we have available through AEM that you know was very consistent with with USDA. Uh, I did pull up the legislation, and, and yeah, to Harold's point, it, it just says uh, the department, in cooperation with Soil and Water Committee, and College of Ag and Life Sciences, uh, with input from other organizations and expertise in soil health shall establish appropriate voluntary standards and objectives for soil health and quality reflective of different geographic regions, soil type, farming operations, and such should include soil quality indicators of biological, physical, and chemical properties of soil and reflect the latest scientific achievements and advancements. There it is. That's, that's the process. In, in reference to that, I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, and this chart right here shows it, right? So we're looking at soil organic matter as that key indicator, right? Um, are there other uh, soil quality indicators that we also should be looking at, or is it really it's about organic matter? I mean, that's the fundamental one that everyone measures and has data on already, but basically all, we think all the measurements are important, yeah. um, and they can all be interpreted in the same um, in the same form, framework and approach. But is that also a good surrogate? So as a soil organic matter goes up, all those other indicators kind of follow? Or should we be looking at other indicators? Not necessarily. I mean, yeah. they, they they tend to be correlated. But, yeah. but the reason why we measure multiple indicators is that they don't necessarily always follow. Uh, certainly, the chemical properties, of course, and uh, aggregate stability is a really important uh, indicator. Uh, you know, there are cases um, uh, like, for example, um, you probably heard about the dairy farm situation. In, Vermont on the other side of Lake Champlain, where uh, there's really big concerns with runoff discharges, you know, into into Lake Champlain, and um, they have a comprehensive nutrient management plan, and you know, every year it's updated. I mean, uh, you know, they tick all the boxes in that that regard, but there's still there's a huge huge concern, right? There, there, there's a problem. So this is a this is the kind of the next step, right? So so everything seems to be okay. Like you do the Russell two analysis, you do the you know, you look at the, the nutrient levels, but yet there's this huge problem, right? And so, um, so we need to have some metrics that sort of address this soil health problem um, because tools like Russell 2 just give you the book value. It's basically a, based, on, based on book values, right? It doesn't actually sort of address what the actual situation in the field is, right? The way a soil test, like a phosphorus value, Right, you don't use a book value for phosphorus. You you take a soil sample and you measure it, right? So so that really needs to happen with soil health as well. It needs to be become part of sort of the AEM process, yeah. and uh, and then the interpretation of that. Maybe it, it, there's a lot of precedent there. There, there. There's already a lot of precedent for soil testing and 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 planning and all that. It, I think it just can be folded into that same paradigm, um, and we need to find ways to do that. And I, and I think in some ways that it, it is certainly uh, already happening. I think it's just not maybe as, as direct or, um, or uh, you, you know, inherent in the process. So 
I, I guess I had one other question too about timeline. I, I, I really think this chart right here shows quite a bit, um, you know, the, the aspirations. So this could be where the farm is at. And, you know, if, if there's a prescription of, of soil health practices, you could get to that 75th percentile or, or maybe 90th. Um, but there often seems to be a, a, a misconception of um, timeline of, of practice adoption, right? And, and by a lot of our policymakers, well, geez, if they just do cover crops next year, they're going to get to that level. That's not necessarily the case. So, how do you build in kind of like a time frame for the particular farm and 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 helping to achieve those 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 voluntary standards or aspirational goals? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think. This interpretation tool, the first step is it really gives you, calibrates you. It's like, yeah. I thought I was doing a really great job, but mm -hmm. there's, I'm still not, there's still a lot of fields and a lot of people that have, my peers that have much better outcomes. So I think that's a starting step, but it is true. Soil, yeah. soil health changes slowly. So it's an important part of the conversation. And this might not, this wouldn't be something you do every year because there's, variability inherent, but yeah. an important snapshot to say, where, where are you at? Um, what might be some things that you can do to? And then, and then those interim benchmarks are important too. And it might not be an increase in solar organic matter that's measurable, but maybe the next year, you know, there's, there's, there's water holding capacity that's measurable or something that the farm can see as they're implementing or adopting these practices. Yeah. You know, yeah. as they're reaching that, that apex. Of and that's one of the value of some of the more sensitive indicators of, of soil health. Some of the newer ones is like, we know organic matter is, is very slow to change because up six inches, 1% across the acre, that's 20,000 pounds of dry matter. So shifting those numbers takes, takes yeah. a long time. Yeah. So some of like active hypoxy, respiration and protein and aggregate stability are more dynamic and are more sensitive management and, and the larger tools. Okay. <clears throat> kind of goes on. So it sounds like we need carbon, right? A lot of carbon. Um, can you just explain some of the um, existing underutilized waste streams that may or may not have been factored in urban wood waste, maybe food waste, maybe biosolids? Is there enough of that? Oh, you, you know, is, is there enough? Um, it's my understanding that a lot of the dairy is optimized their waste in their land base. But if we're asking for more farms to utilize more carbon, where might that come from? I, I would imagine changing uh, you know, practices from one part of the lake to the other it may take decades. But uh, where might this carbon come from in the near term? I'll, I'll, I'll give one thing. Answer and I'll have Debbie give the other answer. So, so on the so so there, 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 there's two aspects of it. One is sort of carbon that's that's a re, that's a waste to resource kind of an issue, right? So I'll, I'll let her talk about it. The other the other one is to think about cropping systems. You know, like for example, I said corn and soybeans have different impacts because of how much biomass they generate. Uh, a cover crop, you know, uh, creates biomass, and the roots have, are beneficial. So that biomass then is carbon and nutrients that can then be recycled. So part of it can be grown in the field itself. Part of it can be brought in. So that's Debbie's part. Yeah, and I, I think um, what I was trying to show with that schematic there is the idea that the organic sources that are going to be available in any particular part of the state are going to vary. Um, and so like thinking about wood chips or leafy debris, things like when there's a storm event and a lot of trees come down, can that woody debris be somehow processed locally and then reused locally instead of, for example, on Long Island, when there's a disaster or with a lot of lawn care companies, they spend millions of dollars transporting that, those carbon sources mm -hmm. off the island, especially with the landfill closing down there. So there's going to be a need for somehow processing those organic wastes and then there's opportunities instead of potentially farmers buying in carbon and nutrients from elsewhere can they reuse what's available instead of taking one source off the island and bringing in another different source can we keep that source locally and reuse those nutrients that's just one example and thinking about what is the value 
to that. And as, as Dale mentioned, obviously there's a lot of costs around this, there's a lot of logistics, there's a lot of policy to it. But can we start rethinking that there are excess nutrients in a certain way that can be reused just in a different manner within the same environment? I mean, just to, to, two examples that, that come to mind. So one is Long Island, like for example, there's a lot of horse manure on Long Island, right? And, and it's yeah. not being used very well. Um, and it, it used to be piled onto one farm, basically, in Nassau County, it's terrible. Uh, but another example, just a couple of days ago, we were talking to, uh, you're familiar with the large uh, solar farm that's being planned for um, in Jefferson County, talking to some of the folks uh, of the company, uh, Oralex, and um, we were just going through, you know, some of the things that they could do, and they said, well, we're going to have to cut down a lot of trees. Um, you know, it's an existing farm, but there's trees that are in the way. And so we're looking at that and say, oh, that's a resource, right? You're going to have to cut those trees down. And so, so there's a lot of times that there are resources available that people simply aren't aware of. And, and so if we can then look at those resources and say, how can we reallocate that and optimize that, um, rather than sort of disposing of it in a, in a pile or something like that. No. Um, so real quick, I guess, before we kind of wrap up this um, topic, uh, there was a comment that came into the chat that kind of um, got back to what we were discussing just a few minutes ago. Uh, Brian talked about how it, you know, it takes a while to see, to see the changes. So that um, is so, it's something important, I think, to recognize, uh, especially if there is a consideration that these be regulatory requirements, because it does take time to, to see any changes. So um, just wanted to reflect that, but also wanted to give uh, anyone else who might be on the line an opportunity to provide any comment or question to our guests. <coughs> The only comment I have is that I think benchmarks are needed in order for us as farmers to be able to determine what is going on with your fields each individually. And it's a very big difference if a farmer has 10 fields or 100 fields on what they can accomplish. I do wish that you strongly add to it in the end that these should be benchmarks and never be used for in enforcement because I worry what our legislature would do some years down the line that um, doesn't yeah, always turn out losing. well, unforeseen we're circumstances. Losing, but I think we got so context. The benchmarks That's are definitely right. needed. I'm going to be able to look at what, what we yeah. Yeah, I need my video off probably. But okay, as long as you got it, we need benchmarks, but I just hope it doesn't go into regulation. And that's uh, very consistent with the uh, concern that was voiced in the chat as well, just now that Bethany <clears throat> referenced. Yeah, the, 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 that's why we really want to work with with you folks. And I mean, uh, Ag and Marcus is the, was identified as a lead in this area, yeah, so yeah. We, we, we need to, we want to work with you. And uh, but because yeah, I think this this concern is also why we are treading very, very lightly on this uh, so that it doesn't get out of hand and all of a sudden you have a sort of health regulation that doesn't serve, you know, the purpose of what we really want. And, and this data actually could, could um, you know, help to address uh, some of the, uh, the, the that uh, uh, expectations that we've seen, like, you know, with the global soil health initiatives and just increase, just increase every, you know, acre of farmland by 1%. You know, globally, it will do you know x amount of good for for climate mitigation, and you know that sounds great on paper, and it's maybe not necessarily uh, achievable, you know, across you know individual farms, and and I think that this benchmarking work actually will help to address some of those uh, uh, well-intentioned uh, uh, policymakers' goals, but but to, to to root it in reality and science, I think is important. I mean, to Darren, your point. Data is uh, actually, uh, you know, very, very reflective of, of what we've all, oh, always known or, or thought we knew, you know, in regards to diverse diversity in our agricultural systems and 
animal agriculture and all of that. What's the next? What's the next step? I know you have on the slide here. You know, certainly continue discussions with policymakers, agencies, and we'll 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 let them you know, share um, this this presentation. Um, you know, we'll be in the in the minutes for this meeting, and, and we would certainly like to have follow up discussions as well, getting the weeds about you know what these benchmarks mean and the next step toward uh, establishing you know voluntary uh, goals. So, um, and also, just to go on along with that, um, I would love to help you know promote. Like, if you do schedule the virtual meetings, you know, we can send that out to our distribution list, primarily soil and water conservation districts, um, to, and you know, to get them at input. Yep, and it could go out to all of the, the advisory members as well that that uh, are part of the state committee, um, just to get additional you know public review and feedback for you. Yep, we would very much. Appreciate yeah, thanks, that. Bethany. That's that's something I was thinking of also. It worked well with the uh, uh, update of the roadmap that mm -hmm. we did this, this past winter. And that format, I think, works well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice thank you. If we have nothing else to, um, before we go into voting advisory, is there is there anything else um, we need to bring up? If, if not, um, we do appreciate the, all, all this, what you brought in on the soil health. I think we uh, we have a long ways to go on that. The thing I'm concerned with in, in part two is it generally takes years to make a good effective change in the soil. So, uh, people need to understand one year ain't gonna make a lot of difference. It takes time. Um, Even a three year contract cycle for, for cover cost implementation and programs. Yep, it takes time. Okay, we'll go into voting uh, advisory reports. You have anything to report, Dave? Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you, Bethany, and go through everybody. Um, okay, I'll start with uh, Erica. Do you have anything? I don't have anything to report. Thank you. Darren? Uh, I'm all set. Thank you. All right. Um, then we'll start going around the room. Tim, do you have anything you want to report today? Perfect. I have nothing, thank you. Okay, um, so I do have uh, at least one item that I do want to uh, mention today for the group. Um, it is that we are planning a conservation project tour for Octo Thursday, October 12th. Um, the tour will be hosted by the Ulster County Soil and Water Conservation District who have worked really closely with Ben Luskin, the Region 5 um, State Committee staff representative, um, to, to identify four projects that we're going to be touring and visiting um, and just taking a look at the wide range of services and you know, projects that soil and water conservation districts are involved in. Uh, we, we are planning to all meet at the district office at 9 o'clock in the morning and depart from there to the various uh, tour stops. And if everything goes according to schedule, we'll be uh, wrapping up the, the tour at our last stop by about 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we are planning to have lunch uh, on the way uh, in the middle of it all. So. Um, I realize that there are some other kind of scheduling conflicts out there with that particular day. Um, turns out October is a really difficult month to try to plan something, but um, if anyone is interested in attending the tour, please um, RSVP to me um, by, I think I put in the email October 5th. It's about a week before, just so we have an accurate count for lunch. Um, we are still working on formalizing uh, the agenda in terms of you know, getting project descriptions and addresses and directions and all that put together. Um, that will be shared with the group 
uh, as well as we get a little bit closer and once we get that finalized. Uh, that is it for me. We'll come back to Brian. Uh, Jeff, do you have anything to report? Uh, yeah, I do want to take a minute to promote the fifth round of the land trust grants. Uh, this current round, which closes in November, on November 17th, uh, is designed to promote agricultural protection outreach activities for preserved farms. However, it's the first time we've offered the ability to conduct outreach related to on-farm marketing, processing, or agritourism. So it's a really uh, unique opportunity. Districts fit right in the middle of this. However, land trusts are the only eligible applicant. So if a land trust reach out, reaches out to you, um, you can point them in my direction for more information, but uh, districts you know, have a close relationship with farmers and we also offer a stipend to conduct outreach on farms for this round. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Tim? Uh, I had a skills workshop Wednesday and Thursday this week. I'm pretty excited about that. Teaching hydraulics with Paula Bagley. Uh, looking forward to it. That's about all I have. All right, so we're going to go back and kind of run through our um, advisory members <clears throat> that are on the line. Um, Brian Rahm for Cornell Kales. Do you have any uh, update or report for the group today? Hey, Bethany, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to note that the, um, the Finger, Lakes, uh, Finger Lakes hub at the DEC based out of Syracuse is going through their Finger Lakes action agenda creation process. Um, and folks like PJ Emmerich uh, and others from Ag and Markets have been involved in those discussions. I think it's been going really well. And I just wanted to you know, say if anybody is interested in learning more about that, um, to, to talk to some of the folks that are involved with that, sort of in, including myself. Thank you. All right, Caitlin with CDEA, and uh, thank you in advance for, for submitting your report. I'll make sure it gets in with the minutes. Oh, great, thank you, Bethany. Just a couple highlights, as Bethany mentioned, you can find all of the details in my, uh, my written, report, written report. As many people have said, conservation skills is going on now through September 21st. I wanna thank NRCS and the state committee and all partners involved for instructing classes and helping to get this year's workshop off the ground. We have over 151 people in attendance and over the next couple of days, 14 amazing classes will be held. This year we changed the location and I heard that a pollinator class will be held at the Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge affording really great on the ground experiences as will all of these classes. Save the date for our upcoming administrative conference. Dustin Lewis sent out information statewide just a few days ago. This year's administrative conference will be held November 6th through 7th at the Doubletree Hotel in East Syracuse. And another save the date for our 2024 Water Quality Symposium, March 12th through 15th, again at the Doubletree Hotel in East Syracuse. Um, a couple of other highlights pertaining to the State Committee. PJ contacted me about the need to get some civil service review exams on SharePoint. So I went ahead and made a folder. All of those review, um, review documents are living on SharePoint now and our division reps are reaching out to their districts to upload any more civil service reviews that can help with upcoming exams. And also Tyler Knapp put out a draft for the state committee's programs and SW form spreadsheet. I sent that around to our division reps and hopefully that will garner some good feedback. Bethany, that's all for me. Thank you very much, Caitlin. <clears throat> 
Um, has anyone joined us from DEC? Okay. Uh, Paul, I see that you are here with DOE. Do you have any <clears throat> report today? Yes, one thing to report. Uh, thank you, Bethany. And that is the uh, annual farm tour hosted by the Watershed Agricultural Council. This would be west of Hudson Watershed for New York City. Uh, we'll have a, we'll be hosting their farm tour on October 12th. Unfortunately, it's the same day as as uh, another farm tour in Ulster County. <laughs> By the way, Greg Albrecht uh, will be attending the uh, farm tour in the New York City watershed. I want to thank him in advance if he's online at the meeting today. Uh, I think he'll have a lot of interesting things to say to the group. All right, thank you, Paul. Yeah, sorry we couldn't make those two meetings uh, jive a little bit better. Yeah, what what are the odds, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Greg is uh, teaching at the Skills Workshop today as well, so not with us, but I will pass that along, Paul. All right, um, has anyone from Department of State uh, was able to join? SUNY ESF. Um, uh, let's see, Cornell Kales, or not Kales, I'm sorry, CCE. All right, and last but certainly not least, Paula from NRCS. Do you have anything to report today? I don't have anything to report. Our, um, our staff are, are hustling to make the end of fiscal year closing closeouts and everything go through so it's um kind of quiet ish <laughs> very good well thank you to all the advisory members uh, who gave reports today um, are there any state committee staff that are on the line that wish to give a report today bethany just a couple quick things for region two um, the conservation skills workshop, as many have said before, that's going to be this week. Tomorrow's the stormwater class, and I just want to thank everybody who helped with that. Our partners at DEC are going to be doing outstanding uh, permit review and things like that as it relates to agricultural stormwater requirements. And then in the afternoon, John Dunkel is going to be doing a, a pretty intensive technical type of class on stormwater BMPs and inspections related to uh, the farmstead. So. Thanks for everybody who helped out on that. Grant closeouts are coming in. Uh, Region 2 is quite active recently with uh, several different grant closeouts and ones that are coming up. Uh, a lot of board meetings and trainings. In fact, I have to jump off here shortly uh, to head down in the southern tier for a board training. But I uh, just wanted to update everybody on the Finger Lakes cover crop program as well. We had a meeting the other day. It's probably what you would consider a second kickoff meeting now that we have the funding in-house and uh, we're getting that program moving. So the money's there and uh, districts, I know I just got an email here a moment ago, uh, they're starting to plan their cover crops for this fall. So that's moving forward in a, in a real wonderful fashion. Um, also just wanted to thank Caitlin uh, for doing that uh, with the SharePoint folder for uploading all that study material. That's gonna be tremendously helpful for new employees. For years and years, all the new employees have asked for that stuff. And in years past, we sort of just relied on a great big hard copy folder. So um, your work, Caitlin, to get that up there is, is greatly appreciated. And I know you'll hear a lot of uh, support from many new district employees that it's so <laughs> easy to um, the NYECD meeting is coming up. I'm going to be working with Ryan on uh, doing a course for that. So hopefully we'll see a lot of board of directors and administrative staff at that. And then just wanted to say thank you again publicly to Paula and the team at NRCS. Scott and I were able to attend uh, the Southeast Regional meeting that was organized by Tony Caprero. And I got to meet a lot of new NRCS staff. And one of the coolest things was uh, Scott and I we're able to give sort of a rundown of our programs and how we um, cooperate with NRCS and some of our uh, requirements and some of NRCS requirements and how we can hopefully marry up some of these programs a little bit more efficiently. So uh, we were very thrilled to be invited to that meeting and I just wanted to thank Paula and the folks from NRCS as well. So that's all I have and thank you. Thank you very much, PJ. 
Any other state committee staff? Yeah, Bethany, this is Ben. Uh, I'll give a brief uh, state aid update. Uh, back in August, we had a state aid to districts forum that was very well attended. Uh, it was three hours long, and we, we ran through all the performance measures and some proposed changes uh, for next year, for 2024. Um, and uh, we got a lot of great feedback, both verbally in the chat, you know, emails after the fact, um, kind of uh, putting all that together. We promised that we would put a survey out, and we're still working on that. That will be out. Um, as soon as we can get it out and get past some of these other priorities and trainings and meetings we've got going on. Um, but so that we can get even more feedback from, from the districts, from staff, and hopefully from board members as well uh, before we, you know, finalize some changes for, for next year's performance measures or more possibly the year after. Um, other than that, the Part B uh, request for proposals or, or request for 2024 is out. That is due November 1st, so that's the $6,000 uh, pot of money um, that the districts can use on a conservation project. So, so like I said, that's out due November 1st. Um, along with that, November 1st, we also have annual action plans for AAM that are due and uh, annual plan of works from the districts as well are also due November 1st. So. A lot of stuff uh, to, to work on to, to get submitted to us in the next uh, couple months by the districts. Uh, other than that, um, very similar to what PJ said for the region, for Region 5, uh, we've had some new hires on, mostly uh, backfills, but um, a couple in Suffolk County, a couple in Orange County, Ulster County. Um, so it's good to see that the district's kind of getting back up to capacity after they've had some uh, some turnover there. But uh I think that's about it for me. Thank you, Ben. Um, coming back, Brian, do you have anything to report today? I do. Thank you, Bethany. Um, like to report to the group some really good news. On Sunday, September 17th, um, Commissioner Ball joined the Sand County Foundation to announce uh, the winner of the 2023 AEM Leopold Conservation Farm of the Year Award. And that went to the Dygert Farms of Palatine Bridge in Montgomery County. Um, that award honors the farm and its nominating soil and water district for their effort to protect the environment through the preservation of soil and water quality. And um, owned and operated by Robbie and Shannon Dygert, the Dygert Farms is a 270 cow dairy farm and dairy processing operation, uh, which crops feed its cows on 650 acres in Montgomery County. That integrated dairy uh, livestock crop operation that we just talked about here with the soil health discussion. Um, so uh, big congratulations goes out to the Dogert Farms and also the Montgomery County Soil and Water Conservation District. This uh, particular event um, was planned and integrated into Sunday on the farm in Montgomery County. So it was a big well attended event. Also, uh, the farm is celebrating their tricentennial year this year, and uh, also took first place in the chocolate milk division for, for the state. So, uh, a lot going on uh, at, the, at, at this farm, um, and uh, uh, congratulations to Robbie and Shannon Dyer and, and to the Montgomery County Soil and Water District. So, uh, again, and, and this uh, this award, the fi other finalists for this award this year were Humbert Farms of Rose and Wayne County and Tangor Farm of Olive Bridge in Ulster County. And um, I think we want to start right away by promoting uh, this uh, prestigious award to all soil and water districts. Um, think about uh, nominating your farms who uh, receive your own conservation district of the year uh, uh, awards or conservation farmer of the year awards within your district. So um, let's keep it coming in. Um, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll be talking about this uh, more regularly and uh, promoting uh, you know, this, uh, this great uh, achievement um, throughout the, the year. So that's, uh, that's what I have to report. Thank you very much. Um, and to round these out, uh, any conservation district that is on the line today or member of the public, if you uh, would like to report anything to the state committee today, please make sure to unmute your line and uh, feel free to do so.
Hi, this is Bill Reinhardt from the Albany County uh, Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, I just want to say I really liked the presentation by the Cornell folks. And I put in the chat uh, that I was interested in getting some contact information uh, about their work uh, because I had some follow up thoughts. Um, and uh, anyway, I really enjoyed the, the uh, climate resiliency work. That's a big focus of mine. I'm also an Albany County legislator and I've been an organic grower for about 30 or 40 years just for my own extended family. Uh, so I, I have a lot of interest in soil health. So I really enjoyed the presentation today, thanks. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and we will make sure to get you that contact information. Thanks. Uh, should, I, should I leave now? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not part of that executive session, so. Well, we haven't quite gotten to that part of the agenda yet. So you okay. can hang up if you like, or if you wanna stay on for the uh, discussion of the next meeting, but you can do that too. <laughs> uh, I, will, I will wait until the, I have to leave. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very good. Thank you. All right, Dale, that concludes our, our, uh, our um, voting advisory staff uh, conservation district report portion. Thank you. Uh, a proposed next meeting date is October 17th. Um, I understand we have some conflicts. I will actually be in Florida and I'll be Skyping or coming in on the computer from Florida for that week. Um, but October 17th, Bethany, everybody, for those that can attend, sound okay? Yeah, I won't be able to make it to 17th. I'll be a state grand session. <laughs> okay, what? I'll be, I'll be here, Dale, or I'll be available. Okay. Yeah. Darren, what do you think? I'm, I'm pretty sure I will not be available. October is hor horrible for me this year, worse than normal. <laughs> Bethany, can you check with Scott? Yes, I will follow up with Scott. Um, if the 17th can't work, we really need to get the CRF rank list approved. Um, could we, I mean, is there an, another date in October, that what's left of October that we could, um, that would be a bit more available for folks schedule, even if we have to offer, you know, all separate like meeting locations, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to do that as long as you guys are okay with me posting alternative locations on the agenda. And it'd be a relatively easy thing to Correct. The week after would probably be much better for me. And okay. I, if, especially if I could, you know. Just come in on the computer. Right, yeah. Yep. Uh, Dave? I think so. I'll have to look on the calendar at home. I'll let you know, but I think it'll be all right next week. Yeah. Um, one day I've got to take my wife to Augensburg for an eye operation. I'm not sure what the date that is. Okay, Bethany, check with Scott if the week after would work for three of us at least. I mean, it will work for me. Um, so it, it, if, if we can get the 17th with Scott, then um, we'll, we'll be, you still have a quorum. If not, um, we'll have to do the week after. Erica, what were you saying about your I, I am on a work trip in Colorado that means that I will, if, okay. if I can be remote and I can mm -hmm. be from a hotel room to make it work. <laughs> well, I will first check with Scott about the 17th and then, you know, if that doesn't work, then we'll, we'll, Pursue our plan B. Yeah, because if you got Scott, we got it covered for the 17th, if you can get him. Um, otherwise, we'll move it to the next week at, at whatever day we can get a quorum. All right. So uh, more to come on that then, everybody. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, okay. So I guess... Yeah, at this point in the agenda, we'll have to ask all the districts that are on the line, with the exception of the CDEA representative, as well as um, any farmers who may also be on the line. Um, we will need you to recuse yourselves from the meeting for um, the discussion of our, the Round 29 at non-point source ranked list and motions. Um, 
to recuse yourself in this platform, we just ask that you, you hang up um, your line. Uh, following the, the round 29 discussion, we will be adjourning the meeting, so there will be no more additional topics. I'm Thank leaving. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. And we'll give everybody a couple minutes to get off. Tim, you're on the podcast. No, because this is, uh, we can record this. Yes. Okay. I actually, I think we are in, um, Looks good. Good shape. So I will, and on the screen, this is super small. I realize that. <laughs> but um, for folks here in Albany, they, we did make hard copies of the ranked list. Um, voting members who received a copy late yesterday. Um, but this is uh, what you're seeing on the screen, the, the ranked list for round 29 of the Ag Nonpoint Source program. So just a reminder on, I guess, on how our scoring process goes. We have a panel of six reviewers from, um, very, from advisory members you know, to the state committee who review each of the proposals that are submitted to the program and score them individually. We then take all the scores from each of the reviewers and aggregate them into um, an aggregated total. From there, uh, we assess whether or not the uh, applications, if they are applying for preference points, we assess whether or not they've met the minimum or min bleh, met the criteria to earn those preference points, and they are, are awarded uh, onto the aggregated total. That is what gets us to the grand total, which is the very uh, far right column on the, the ranked list that you're, you see here. Um, once those totals are established, we rank them highest to lowest. And based on our available funding, we are able you know, to award <coughs> until all that funding is spent. For round 29 per the RFP, $13.5 million was made available to support projects through this round. Um, we never put a, a funding line on this ranked list because sometimes we do have the opportunity to go a little bit further down the line if funds have been returned to the program. Um, so so we kind of just, just leave it open that we will fund um, you know, until, until the, the Dollars are spent. Um, just a real quick recap, we had 96 proposals come in uh, to this round uh, from, you can see at the bottom of the list, once I scroll to it and zoom it in a minute, um, those 96 applications represented uh, a total state funding request of approximately $39 million and an overall total project cost of just shy of $60 million. We had 189 farms um, be included in the applications. Of those uh, 52 CAFO farms were included. 46 farms indicated that they would be um, applying for cover crops, and that is a like three times higher than what uh, the participating farms uh, were in round 29 or 28. Um, approximately uh, just shy of 25,000 acres of cover crop was proposed, 69 waste storages, 61 farms proposing to implement riparian buffer systems, and so on. Um, I'm going to go back up to the first page here and pause just to let folks. I guess take it all in. Um, are there any questions at this time?
Anyone questions, comments, anyone? This Did I get a motion? Oh. No, go ahead, Beth. Before we, yeah, um, so this rank list will become an official record of, of the minutes, but um, I guess before we get into the motions, um, we have to actually um, approve resolution 23-01, which I can um, you know read out to the group. That was included on page two of the, the meeting agenda. So uh, resolution 23-01 states that subject to the availability of funds, the committee shall award funding pursuant to round 29 of the Agricultural Non-Point Source Abatement and Control Grant Program for Projects 1 through 96 in order ranked and in the amounts recommended by the advisory members of the committee until funds available for this purpose are exhausted or the scoring threshold is reached consistent with the Soil and Water Conservation District law, the RFP, and any other law applicable to funding of such projects. Consistent with the RFP, the committee authorizes the Department of Agriculture and Markets to negotiate the terms of the contract with the project sponsors and to make minor adjustments to the project description and budget as necessary to achieve project goals, conform to applicable laws and regulations, and to serve the best interests of the state. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Could I get a motion to approve round 29, Ag Non Point Source Rank Approval List Resolution 23 01? So moved. And a second, please. Second. Um, we'll go to voting. Dave? Yeah. Darren? Yeah. Erica? Aye. Approved. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you all anything, very much. Anything else on that, um, Bethany? Uh, just a real quick note. Um, Brian mentioned earlier that uh, this week is Climate Week, and uh, Chamber approached the, the department looking to see if we were going to be having any award announcements ready. Specifically, they were interested in the Climate Resilient Farming Program. Um, that one, since seeing as that is not, not ready yet, we are going to be uh, putting out a press release sometime this week announcing the awards for, for round 29. So subsequently, we will be getting awards uh, letters out to districts in very, very quick order, which is quicker than normal, but, but it's a good thing because it will get the process moving along for everybody. Um, so stay, stay tuned for that. We'll make sure to forward out that press release as soon as it comes out. Excellent, thank you. Anyone else have anything you wanna bring up before we adjourn? All right, we are adjourned, everyone, and we will um, see what we can make out for the October 17th meeting quorum. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks, all. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Our board is going to be extremely excited to hear about this. <laughs> I thought so. Um, Christos has been asking.